Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Safaya here with Ideal Traits and uh, Insurance Sales Lab. Uh, super excited to go over this topic today. Um, if you guys have seen this video, uh, one of our videos already, um, that's awesome. We're glad to give you some more content because we got a really good response <laughs> from uh, the previous video that we did. And for those of you who haven't watched, I just I want to give a quick intro uh, again of Vlad and Kevin because they are obsessed with helping people in the insurance industry. And I think it's just going to be uh, pretty great for you guys watching because it just gives credibility to who's going to be uh, talking about um, avoiding cost of bad hires and also talking about um, insurance recruiting strategies. So Vlad, if you could just give a quick intro on what you do and how you help agents and why you're here today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Vlad with the Insurance Sales Lab. And what I do is I work with PNC insurance agents and help agents and their staff uh, close more business. That's what it bo really boils down to. I have a sales training course called the One Call Close Masterclass. Uh, I'll include a, a link at the end of this video for agents to check it out. But one of the things that I always tell agents is that even if you don't train your staff and you don't give them the, the best leads and you don't hold them accountable, if you have the right people working for you, the A players, they'll find a way to figure things out. And that's the that's why having this conversation is so important and identifying some of those key components of hiring great people uh, and, and why we're doing this call is because if you can find the, the, the best team members out there to work in your agency, it makes your job as an agency owner that much easier. They'll be a lot more receptive to learning how to sell. Uh, they'll close more business and long-term it'll be better for them and you as the agency owner. So I'm excited to share these uh, hiring tips in today's call. Thanks, Vlad. And, uh, you know, we, we love getting on with you because, you know, you, you provide so much value to agents and anything we can do to support you, we're, we're going to do because we know you're very credible. Uh, and then Kevin, give a little background on you um, and talk about, you know, why you're on this call today. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and, and thanks, Vlad, as always, for, for joining the conversation. Uh, first and foremost, I'm an agent. I'm an insurance agent, just like you, and I've been an agent since March of 2007. We've opened up five locations from scratch, grew up 20 million organically, and also the co-owner of Ideal Traits. Um, done, you know, lots of sales training and, and, and staff training and love the, the topic of hiring, of course, and anything that we can do to provide more value and to be able to just give you extra little nuggets, um, that's, that's what our ultimate goal is to do today. So looking forward to today's topic. Thanks, Kevin. And again, I appreciate both of you guys being on here. Um, I know I brought this up to you originally when we were talking to all the agents that joined our last webinar, they, they wanted a topic like this. They want to know you know, okay, so there's a process to hiring, just like you have a process to sale, but what do we need in that process to avoid the cost of a bad hire? And that's why today I just wanted to set the table, right? Um, a lot of agents, when you talk to them about hiring, you know, that they sometimes don't have the greatest experience. And sometimes they don't know what the cost of a bad hire did to their agency. Maybe they don't have their numbers because they're so busy in other areas, but we're here today to to really go over the cost and talk about that. So if I may, I wanted to go over just a, some, just some big uh, key things here of why the cost of a bad hire and what the breakdown looks like is important to know at your agency. So number one is you know the advertising. When you're getting a job ad out there, um, some of you have already been on the job boards or using them now. To get really good placement, it's gonna be hundreds if not maybe thousands of dollars right? Um, but that's not even close to the, what goes into the cost of a bad hire. It's the recruitment cost. It's the interview cost. It's the productivity loss. And what I would like to do is have Kevin, you know, because Kevin, although you're amazing at, um, at hiring now, right? You still have sometimes cost of bad hires and, you know, you've had your failures. So let's dive in and talk, talk about what did that look like to your business and talk about what, what was the most costly, on your end when you had those experiences? Well, you know, I think some of the, the hidden costs that, uh, you know, a lot of agents maybe don't consider is, uh, you didn't mention productivity lost, and that would just be 
putting a new person in, in particularly even untrained person on the phone with a, a valuable client and then they don't close. That's the cost of, 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 a, of a hire, knowing that cost if, if you hired the wrong person. Um, the other is just the thought of training them. So it's gonna take countless hours of training and mentoring. And during that time, you're not selling. You're, I mean, you're literally doing something else. You've got your new hire and yourself or your manager all together. And that's a lot of time and effort out of it. So those are some of the hidden, the real costs that if you didn't train, you would be more productive. And, and for obvious reasons, of course, you wanna spend a lot of money to make sure that it becomes productive down the road. Um, and then the most obvious is just, if you wanted to dismiss all of that, which I don't think you really can, yeah, you definitely wanna look at how much you pay them. You know, if somebody sticks around for three, four or five months, I mean, you got 10, 12, you know, $15,000 just in hard costs that, that you wrote checks for. So, you know, th there's, there's a lot more to be said than just, uh, their, their paycheck alone. Yeah, if you break down the math on just the paycheck alone, not the other hidden costs, let's say you hired someone and you're paying them 2,000, 2,500 bucks a month. Let's say with, with payroll taxes, your out the door expense is $2,500 per month. Most producers or even CSRs, they're, they're not super productive in the first month because they're getting set up, they're getting trained. And after the first month, you realize that, okay, this person is not learning as quickly as I wanted them to. They're not producing. Second month rolls around. They write a little bit of business, but not as much as you want them to. Now you spent $2,500 the first month, $2,500 the second month. Now you're $5,000 out for this new hire. And then the third month, they don't improve. Then now you spent $7,500. And that's that's money out the door that you can never get back. You can't ask for a refund with team members. Once you hire, <laughs> right. you pay right. Them, right? So, and that's not even factoring in the hidden costs that you just mentioned, Kevin, of missed sales opportunities of a potentially a big household. Anytime that you or your staff spent training that person. So $7,500 is the bare minimum that you have to factor in as a loss for you as the agency owner when you're bringing on the wrong person. So that's the cost of a bad person, in my opinion. And frankly, and tell me if you disagree on this, Kevin, but a lot of agents after 90 days, they feel like, man, I'm knee deep with this new hire. Let me give them another month. Let me give them another two yeah. months and see if they find a way to make this work. And then as it turns out, a lot of times they don't. After a couple of months, the, 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 the new team member just never gets better maybe a little better, but not enough to keep them on board. But the agency owner feels like, I can't let this person go. I've already invested $12,000 into this person. Um, letting them go is just parting ways with a $12,000 investment. And that's how bad teams are formed. Agents rush the hire, and then they end up paying the consequence. And guess what? Once you have a few of those bad hires, and then a great candidate comes through, and they look at the people that work there, they might be reluctant in joining that agency. So it's super important to only bring on great team members. Totally agree I'm with glad that. that's a builder, good point. Career Builder actually had an ad, um, not an ad, but a, an article. Um, and it might've been a year or two ago, but it was like 50,000 is what they said yeah. is the average hire. And then tr think about this, Vlad and Jeff, is not only whatever number you come up with in your head, between 10,000 and 50,000, the, the bad hire versus being a good hire, right? So now the good hire, you can generate, you know, especially in year two, let's just say 50,000. So instead of losing, we'll take the middle 25 grand, making 50, it's a $75,000 swing. So either way you look at it, we're, we're talking about large dollars for each individual hire that you make. Yeah, and I know that's one of the videos that right. we're coming up where we're going to break down that math of what a A player <laughs> will do to the yeah. agency in terms of your bottle line and then versus like a B or C player. So I'm excited to have that webinar. Uh, so for yeah. anyone watching this video, make sure you stay tuned and um, look out for the upcoming webinars that we do.
you know, thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, a lot of agents will just laugh it off and it's tough because you, you kind of laugh with them, but when it starts costing the agency more and more money, and then sometimes, I mean, with my new agents that I talk to, it could be to potentially going out of business, right? It's not a laughing matter. So how do we avoid the cost of a bad hire? And one of the biggest things that we found with all of our research and data that we've done here at Ideal Traits, because it was actually created by Kevin and a couple other agency owners that he partnered with. Um, we only work with our insurance agents. So we have this data to show that the desperation hire leads to more times than not the, the cost of a bad hire, right? So what can we do? And Vlad, I know you've talked to a lot of agents yourself that, you know, they say they're not going to hire right now because they don't have time for it. And then all of a sudden they lose someone and shoot, hey, I, I have to hire someone within the next couple of weeks. So how do we avoid that? How do we avoid the cost of bad hire? Well, it's being prepared and, you know, it's not doing the desperation hire. So that's what I want to kind of lead into here because we need to really discuss this, especially with brand new agents coming in, because unfortunately they don't know what that could look like. So Kevin or Vlad, I'd love for you to discuss what your recommendations are here. Yeah. So, you know, we'll call this, uh, you know, pointer tip number one is uh, we, we really like to refer to it as the ABH rule, which is always be hiring. Always be hiring. You know, uh, a, a lot of agents, and, and I could say that I'd be guilty too at some point or another, is we've got <laughs> this unrealistic approach and thinking that, you know, you walk in with your team, which just happened 32 days ago now, and you <laughs> said, uh, this is the team. Like, we're good for the year. That's what's going to happen. And I want you to think back at all those years and how many times that was true by the time December 31st came around. And that doesn't mean that you did anything wrong or they did anything wrong or you hired the wrong people. You may or may not have. I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into it. But ultimately, realistically, there are, there, there are not too many agencies that look exactly the same January 1 as they do 365 days later. And so I think it is being realistic. You know, the realistic approach that says at some point, someone may leave and or I am going to need to grow my team and grow into the goals that we've set ourselves out for. And so be realistic in your approach and always be hiring. What that does is let you, you know, take a look at approaches of either you're either passively hiring or you're actively hiring. Now, passively hiring means that that January 1 where the team looks good and maybe you just hired somebody and you feel really good about your team at that point. Well, that that point is when you passively hire. So you get your job out, your job ad out on the job boards. Uh, you maybe do free advertising. You may go to a job fair if those even exist anymore in today's world. I'm not really sure. Um, but hopefully those things come back around. But you're, you're staying in tune. You're staying in touch you're being realistic, is, is what I like to say. And then actively hiring is when you kind of kick it up a notch. So somebody does leave, you're going to grow your team, even a better reason why, and you can actively hire. And if that's going to take a few extra dollars, you'll probably um, sponsor your job ad on Indeed or some other sites and get out and spend more time each day and or um, you know each week rather than what you were doing on the passive side. Passive side, you may spend an hour to a week. Active, you might spend an hour a day because you, 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 know, you, you need this. But by passively hiring, the actively hiring is gonna be a lot less time. And by doing that, you know, you're gonna always be interviewing and it creates for a much better and a smoother transition for that new hire. Yeah, let's look at the flip side of that, Kevin, for a moment. Let's say I'm not, always hiring because I have a full staff, two sales producers, two CSRs. I'm happy. Life is good. We're hitting our numbers. And suddenly one of the team members, like you said, has to leave. Now I'm in a different position because I know the second person is going on paternity leave and I need to fill those spots ASAP. Right. What am I going to do? Not only am I going to spend more money on the job boards to get more candidates, but I'm going to find every reason to take anybody with a pulse who's who's ready to get uh, licensed and who wants to work in that position and offer them a job. If I offer them a job at, say, a $2,000 a month uh, base salary and they say, look, the only way I'll take your job is at $2,500, I'm, I'm going to do that because I'm desperate, right? Yes. That's not a position that we want to be in. 
And the kind of questions that you're going to ask in the interview are all going to be, uh, like you like to say, setup questions. Uh, Kevin, you, you brought up some examples last time we spoke. Uh, maybe you could share some of those questions yeah. The agents often ask when they're desperate uh, to hire a, a team member. Share some of those questions, please. Yeah, I mean, it could be something like, hey, lad, I mean, uh, do you like to show up? Will, will you show up on time every day? Of course. That's oh, what okay. I do. And then I'm like, yes. the interview on time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Vlad, um, as far as, uh, you know, staying late. Now, you don't have to every night, but if you had to stay late, could you possibly stay late? I, I think I can make that arrangement. If I'm oh, good, it. good. Okay, and, and then Vlad, I know you were interviewing for a sales position. And do you think that you'd be good at sales? Oh yeah, I'm great at sales. <laughs> so, you know, I maybe over-exaggerated a little yeah. bit, but what happens is your reticulating activating system, you're looking for these positive results because you're, you have this desperation need, you need somebody right now. And then whatever they say, you really filter that in, you take it through your, your filter and it say, this is good. And then you might even filter out what would be bad. Like, you know, hey, do you like to, you know, telemarket all day long? And Vlad goes, you know, kind of, maybe. And you're like, going, well, he didn't really mean that. I'm sure he understands that in sales that he's going to have to do some telemarketing. So he's okay. Check the box, you know. So we just have to be, and, and again, it comes back to being realistic. Like your gut is going to tell you your gut will know. And, um, you know, in that desperation hire, what happens is we, we avoid our gut. Like we, we don't take it to its full effect. We know what it, what should happen. And yet we uh, maybe set that aside a little bit because we're desperate. Yeah. Two quick points on, on that before we move on is that the timeline to get a person who's not licensed to get licensed first, put a two week notice if they're employed somewhere else, then get licensed, go through through all the, the, the hoops that they have to jump through before they can start in day one. Best case scenario, we're talking about one month. Uh, worst case scenario, it could take who knows how long, five to six months or longer. So if you know you're not looking to hire someone this month, but you might be looking to bring someone on in the future, be actively recruiting at all times so that uh, you're not you're not desperate and scrambling last minute so you, or you have a month where you don't have a producer in place. And secondly, uh, if you're going to be um, always hiring, even though you're fully staffed, it gives you some more control in the fact that you'll be looking out for just the A players. And that's something that I want to make very clear is that agents should commit to only hiring A players. And A players are not just... Uh, above average, they're the best of the best, the top 1%. Those that can come in and write 60, 70, 80, or up to 100 items a month without having a lot of leads, without having any coaching, without having any accountability, they just have that in their DNA. And those people are out there. They're in every city, every town. You just have to find them. And if you're always hiring and you're fully staffed and that person comes along and you interview them, they like you, they like the team, they like everything, are you going to offer them a job, even though you're not hiring at that time? Probably. And then Absolutely. that person comes in, they crush it for you. So um, those are some key points to consider as far as why agents should always be hiring. And, you know, uh, last point on that is uh, great with the, the A and B and C players. The A players, because they're more rare, they do take longer to find. I mean, again, realistic. It's going to take a little bit longer. You could stumble into one that your first interview. But realistically, you're going to have to kiss a few frogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a very good point, too, Vlad, that you made. Because Kevin and I, when we're doing sales meetings, obviously, it's, it's virtual now. But um, what we try to do when we're listening to calls with agents and we're, we're talking to them on the phone is know what their timeline is, right? Because if the timeline, like they might say, hey, I, I'm, I, I don't want to start with, let's just say ideal traits. I don't want to start posting an ad or I don't want to start looking in another, you know, month, right? But then you ask them when do you want to hire someone? Oh, a month and a half from now or two months from now. You're so already late. we have, yeah, exactly. So we have that timeline. If any agents are on this uh, and you just want to know a, a timeline for specific roles that you're looking for um, with specific requirements, we have the average timeline that it takes. So definitely get with us, give us a call and we'll talk to you about that. 
Um, but this is good because if you are always hiring, not aggressively per se, I mean, unless you're in full growth, that's great for you agents out there. But what Kevin and Vlad are talking about is at least passively having an ad out there all, all, all year long in case someone were to leave or in case you're, there is that top producer that's out there and you want them to apply to your agency versus another agency. You want to get on them first, of course. So what does that look like? Are we just going to throw any ad out there? Are we just going to throw any opportunity out there? Or are we going to really deliver a value proposition? So that's why I want to get into like, what is a compelling job ad? We talked about this a little bit in a couple of our last webinars that we did. But um, Vlad, I'd like to lead off with you. What would be a compelling ad? And what would you say to an agent if you're talking to him or her? What would you add? What would they add to yeah. make it effective? Yeah, if you look, if you go to Indeed and type in insurance sales position in your city, you're going to have a lot of different companies pop up, State Farm, Farmers, Allstate, Liberty Mutual, Geico uh, in some cities, uh, independent agents. Everybody's job description looks very similar. Like if take the mm -hmm. title out, you could, and you compare all the job descriptions, they're about 90% identical. So it's, it's the little details that you can implement in or put in your job description that can make you stand out. Something I did for myself about uh, four to six weeks ago, is I added a few points there. One says, if you're looking to be part of a very competitive sales environment with an opportunity to make a, and then I put in the number of how much they could make in the first year, then this may be the career for you. That's in the job overview. And then in the responsibilities, I put in um, having a ton of fun while being part of a competitive team. So incorporating the word fun and then uh, saying that we have a very competitive team. Uh, and then in the requirements, you know, you have the basic requirements that you need of a person. But then at the very end, I said, uh, must have a fun and easygoing personality. So I'm incorporating some of those key buzzwords that a lot of these millennials uh, look for. And it's funny when people are submitting their short answer responses of why they're applying for this job or what interests them about this job, they bring up those specific things that I like that. This is a fun and competitive environment where the other thing I put in here is that um, ability to achieve high sales targets. I'm not afraid to put that in there because that's what we would expect of them. So right off the bat, this candidate knows that, okay, if I'm, a, if I'm not someone who's good at sales, I've never sold anything before, I probably shouldn't apply for this position because it's a competitive position and they expect you to achieve high sales targets. So they're not going to apply in the first place. But if I feel like, oh, this job speaks to me, I'm going to try to sell myself in the short answers and say, I have sold things before. I like working in competitive environments. Uh, so those are just some like the surface level things that make a huge uh, impact. But to go one step deeper, nowadays, the job uh, board is just one of many things that candidates look at. They will always Google your, your company. They'll look at your Google reviews. They'll look at your Facebook page. They'll look at your pictures. They'll look at, they'll stalk you personally on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, they'll look at a lot of different uh, social channels to better understand what kind of agency this is. They're going to do that for your agency and other agencies. And if they see that the agency just down the road from you has a better Facebook page with team pictures, better Google reviews, just overall their online presence is better, they might give that agency a shot over you. Even though you might be a better environment, you have to sell them on your agency past just the job description. So it's an obvious thing to say, but I think it's worth noting that a lot of agents miss that. I know of a lot of great agents, you two know those agents where uh, they just amazing environments to work in, but they don't have great reviews. They don't have many reviews and they don't have any updated mm -hmm. pictures of their team uh, doing fun stuff. And I think that prevents them from getting a lot of new people to apply. Okay. You're on mute, Kev. Oh man, how many times has that happened in, <laughs> in our virtual webinars? <laughs> oh, you're still muted. There we go. I just you're still muted. <laughs> 2020, 2021. <laughs> but um, I was just going to say, you know, a really good points. And, and in addition to that is, you know, what about the awards and successes that your team has already achieved? You know, I think that people, you want to be a part of a winning team. Well, what kind of awards have you already won 
and to know, you know, kind of what the level and what the expectations are. And, you know, beyond that would even be community outreach and involvement and being able to get out in the community and knowing that you're making a difference, not only at work, but also in a community to help out in any way. So those are things that the environment, the culture is really important to uh, the, the people today that are, that are applying for jobs more than it ever has been in the past. No, that's great. Quick live example of yesterday, and then we'll go on to the next key point. Um, I had an agent call in from Texas, and he gave me a call after a webinar that I was on, and um, he had a few applicants that apply. He was really happy with uh, the what was going on with his with um, his exposure with his job ad, but he obviously, you know, was just calling in to see, hey, how do I get maybe more exposure? How do what would be the best uh, advice? And um, I just took one quick look at his ad before I sent him over to my client success team. And, you know, it looked like a good ad. He used really good templates, but I just went ahead and asked him, David, why would an agent, a producer, sorry, apply to your job ad? Why would they do it? He, I, I, if, I, if I could write all this down, Vlad and Kevin, he probably gave me 12 points. He went on and on about how great his opportunity is, right? How for farmers, they have, a protege program and there's a room where they can mentor them and obviously get them to um, an agency owner position. And I know I'm skipping ahead on our slides here, but also he gave all the awards, awards that he has. He's one of the best agents in the state and even top five per, or sorry, top 1% in the country. And there was none of that was on his job ad at all. Right. And he says that he usually doesn't bring it up in interviews because he doesn't like to brag. Well, Kevin, what would you say? Right. You would say it's, good to brag about your office. Winners want to work for winners, yeah. right? And so that goes a long way. And I just said, David, everything you just told me, I would articulate or just put it right into the job ad. Great point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, now, Kevin, this is something where with your hiring process, and I know this firsthand because I went through it, um, you do create what seems to be obstacles for the candidate, right? Obviously, you provide a really good candidate experience. Um, you do a really good job, I feel like, which agents definitely need to adapt to is walking in the shoes of a candidate. What are they going through? They're doing what Vlad said, and they're obviously looking online at reviews. And you got to think, okay, why would they apply to your ad? What do you have at your office other than other offices? But what Kevin does is he creates obstacles because he knows that if they can't handle that type of um, candidate experience, well, are they going to be able to handle the day-to-day -day obstacles at their office? So at his office, sorry. So Kevin, if you could elaborate on that and talk about why you do these obstacles and what it consists of, I think it would be helpful to agents tuning in right now. Yeah. And it, and it leads a little bit back to um, as far as, you know, avoiding the desperate, the desperation hire is you put a job ad out there, they apply to the job ad, you say, come in for an interview. And then you say, well, you know, just come in on Monday, we'll have your computer ready to go. And it, there's no obstacles in place. And it's really simple and easy to do. And I think what you'll find that you get out of that is a very non-committal employee. Uh, they didn't have anything, they can show up on Monday. And if they don't like it by Wednesday, it's like, well, you know, hey, sorry, you know, it didn't really work out. So what I like to do is to make sure that someone is committed. And I make them, you know, really commit up front by going through our process. So our process, you know, consists of generally is, you know, they, they find the job ad and they have to take the assessment. They have to complete that. Uh, we'll do a Zoom kind of meet and greet. We'll, be, we'll do that. Uh, maybe it's just on the phone, but I like to get it on Zoom. Uh, next, I'll have them come in, uh, face masks and all, and we'll do a, an in-person interview with them. And then after the in-person interview, so, it, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about the candidate at this point. Um, at this point, the next obstacle I do is I give them a task. And the task is I'm going to give you three days. So, and I'll kind of do like, okay, today's Tuesday. And I go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So by Friday at noon is when I want you to call back if you're still really interested in the role. And then I'll think about it too. But you have to be the one that commits first. And so then I know like Friday at noon passes and they can't follow directions. So make sure that they have a, a specific deadline for that. So Friday at noon comes and they say, boy, this is great. I'm really excited about it. And I say, you know, I'm interested in learning more too. 
So I bring them in once again to do an observation. And by observation, they come in and I let them know that, you know, it'll be a few hours, but you can stay longer if you'd like. So obstacle there is they maybe have to take off work. They have to set time aside. I told them that it's a few hours, but they can stay longer. So here's a big tip. I mean, the longer they stay, the more interested you are and committed you have as a candidate. What they get to observe is exactly what they'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, they truly get a sample. They'll get a sample of all the telemarketing and all the phone calls and um, you know the, the, the behind the scenes, so to speak, of what they're doing. After that, I'll bring them into the office and I'll say, how was your observation day? You know, they give me the feedback. And then I specifically ask them this question, which creates another obstacle in their mind. I'm trying to catch them off guard. And I'll say, and this is right out of a, a Chet Holmes book, The Ultimate Sales Machine. And what he says is, oh, yeah. is um, you know, I'm not <laughs> quite sure you're the one. Now I didn't oh, say, boy. for sure you're not the one, I didn't say you're not the one. You know, I left some room for some for them to read into it, and I said, you know, even for someone you like, even for somebody I like, because it it what happens next is is the critical moment. So again, Vlad, it's you want the job, right? Think about this: you're the candidate, you really want the job. You've gone through these obstacles already, and I go, you know, I'm just not. I, I told you in the beginning, I'm only looking for A players, and I'm just not quite sure you're the one. And then I be, and then I'm shut up. I just be quiet, and I observe. And then two things is going to happen. Number one, they're going to get up. Vlad's going to get up and walk away, and he's going to go, okay. And what does that tell you? That when faced with um, a, an objection, when faced with failure, when faced with an obstacle, they're going to flee. And so this is really emulating and representing. Maybe they're on the phone with the client. Client says, you know, I'm not quite sure. I want to switch to your company, and they're going to go, oh, okay. Well, thank you. Have a nice day, call you in six months, or do they fight back and do they defend themselves? So Vlad would probably would come back and just say something like, well, well, wait a minute. Like in my last job, I was, you know, in the top 5% and I was, you know, captain of the football team and I was head of student council and everything that I've done, I've succeeded at, and I'm sure I can succeed at this too. And that's exactly the type of answers that we're looking for. You said you wanted this and that's exactly what I am essentially. And so when they fight back, I was like, whew. And then I kind of do one of these, like, thank you. Like, I didn't want to. <laughs> I was hoping that you would come. It was kind of a test. And so I really appreciate that. And then the last and final obstacle, which is a big one, a lot of agents can't swallow this. They can't really stomach it to know that I say, next, what I need you to do is to go get licensed on your own. Will you pay for that? And the answer is no. After six months, I will, of working here, I'll re reimburse you but you're gonna to have to find the money. You're gonna to have to do it on your own time, on your own dime. And by that, if they go through that and they come into your office, I mean, you, you've locked them in for at least six months. I mean, they've told all of their friends and family, right? I'm studying, I'm gonna be an insurance agent. I'm gonna sell insurance. They've told everybody. And while they're doing that, they're actually creating a binder and a folder of you know, 50 deck pages of their closest friends and family. So day one, when they walk in, they're ready and they're prepared to succeed. And you think about the difference of somebody who has nothing into it other than literally arriving on day one versus a folder full of deck pages and an insurance license. Now tell me, who do you think it has, is going to be most likely to succeed? Mm -hmm. so. That's yeah. what I talk about when, you know, creating obstacles. Don't make it so easy. You're yeah. going to have to throw some wrenches in there because if they really want, it's going to be a job, it's going to be a career, what we really want to call it for, for long time, years to come. Aren't you willing to put in a little effort? Aren't you willing to make a few sacrifices? Yeah. Yeah. I, I could not agree more. And what I'd like to say to echo that is what you're doing there, Kevin, is you're not coming across as a, desperate employer who's just willing to hire anyone and fill in the shoes uh, of the person who left or just add another person in your organization. What I like to do early on in the interview process uh, when I'm doing an in-person interview is I tell them how many people applied and how many people I'm actually meeting with. So I often say, you know, we had in the last 30 days, 70 
five people apply for this position. I've only met with three people and you're one of those three. So congratulations on making like it that far. So yeah. it makes the person feel good about themselves and it makes them want to continue jumping through those obstacles and hoops to prove yeah. to you that they're better than the others, those other two people that, that are coming in. So all that said, having those obstacles put you in, puts you in a position of control and power, but there's also a fine line that you have to walk. And I'll bring up a couple points on this. One is that uh, if, if you portray yourself as a non-desperate uh, employer, that's good. But once you're past that phase of putting them through all those obstacles, you've got to flip the switch and make it very clear to this candidate, to this applicant that, look, I want you. I think you would succeed here. I think you're a great fit in this organization. And you need to massage that relationship up until the points and really even later. But until they start working in your agency, until day one occurs, talk to them every day set up a, a coffee meeting, grab lunch with them, learn more about them. This is while they're getting licensed. Forget about the last few jobs. Sit down and say, Kevin, tell me about your family. Tell me about what you do outside of work. What are you into? Um, what did you think of the game last week? Whatever they're into, just talk to them, learn more about them. And guess, guess what? Something might come out through those conversations that will tell you more about that individual that never really... Uh, came out during the interview process, and then you'll identify that, okay, I do not want this person, but I think John Smith down the street is desperate. I'll, I'll refer this candidate over to them. You'll call up the other agent and say, hey, I'm not going to hire this candidate for this reason, but if you want to interview them, you can. And then maybe you can refer that person over to another agent to save yourself uh, the headache of bringing on the wrong hire. So the point is this, you have to make the candidate feel like they're wanted. Uh, back in 1983, 1984, when Michael Jordan was drafted by the Chicago Bulls as the third pick, he was coming in as a good prospect of good uh, player, but no one really thought he was going to be who he ended up being. So back then, Nike was not a big organization, not nearly as big as Adidas. And Michael Jordan really wanted to sign with Adidas. That's the organization that he wanted to work with. But Adidas was very passive when it came to that meeting. He came to the meeting, all hyped up. They offered him a number. He countered with a bigger number. And then he said, look, let me just take, he didn't even want the interview with, with Nike. His dad forced him to do that interview. So he had that meeting with Nike. They gave him a way better offer than Adidas. I think it was like, I don't even remember the figure, so I'm not going to make it up, but it was like two or three times as much as what Adidas offered him. And, and, MJ still wanted to go with Adidas. So they came back, he came back to Adidas and said, Hey, I'm going to give you guys one shot. This is what Nike gave me. Are you going to offer or uh, match the offer? They said no. And that was the beginning of the end for Adidas in the US. Uh, and it was the beginning of something special for Nike because they, they made MJ feel like they really wanted him. And that was a big bet that they won, right? They ended up crushing it. Massive. Really. Yeah, massively. It was that move that changed the organization around. And Nike would not be what it is right now if it wasn't for that meeting. Like, think about that. Nike would not be as big as they are if it wasn't for the way that they handled that meeting. And you never know who you're speaking to when you're hiring a staff member. You might be talking to a, a candidate who has been working in the library for the last six years because that's been their job. They've been very committed. They've enjoyed what they're, they've been doing. And you might look at that as a, as a negative thing because they haven't been a salesperson for the last six years. But look past the obvious. Try to learn more about the person. Put all the obstacles in front of them. But once you realize, okay, this person is going to be good, make them feel special. It's kind of like dating. You don't want to act overly desperate, but you want the other you want the partner to feel like you want them. So it's the same thing when it comes to recruiting. That's my two cents. I love it. I love it. No, Vlad, I didn't know. I mean, I've heard about that story a little bit, but I'm glad you said it because it makes so much sense. And of course, with the girl situation, I think uh, <laughs> it relates to a lot of people, right? You can't be yeah. obviously overly desperate, but you also have to acknowledge, um, you have to acknowledge, like if you get to candidates, you mentioned like, 
telling them like, hey, there's a, there's a certain stepping stone where you know it's a good fit for both, acknowledge that and tell them that they're a good fit, right? You got to acknowledge the candidate's existence. And what I would say is make it mandatory to your office to always thank every applicant for applying and going that far through the process. Provide the feedback if they're not a good fit. Provide the feedback on why they're a good fit. So important. And it goes a long way. A couple stats I just want to share real quick because I just want this to hit home on why it's so important to have positive candidate experience. And as Vlad mentioned, really good reviews. 60% of job seekers report a negative candidate experience with the employers they engage with. 72% of job seekers report sharing their negative candidate experiences online. 72%. And then 55% of job seekers report avoiding certain companies after having negative experiences with uh, those companies, right? So if we think about farmers or Allstate or, you know, um, State Farm, you, your agency, of course, it hurts you because it's your agency um, in, your, in the community where they don't want to ever apply to your ad again or don't want to do business with you. And then also you're hurting the company. Right, because it's State Farm as a whole, or Farmers as a whole, or Allstate as a whole. So think about those things and um, the adversity part, Kevin. I think it's it's, it's amazing that you said that because it makes me think of all the awkward moments in the interviews. I think it's good for agents because when I give them this advice, they sometimes they'll, they'll get back to me and they'll be like, "It was a little awkward when because I really liked him and I wanted to move to the next step, and I didn't ask them. I didn't make them feel uncomfortable." And I've done a lot of interviews and it's weird for me to do it. Kevin, you've done thousands of more interviewers, inter sorry, interviews than I have. I think that takes practice. And I think what would be good for the agent if they've never done it before is to role play with current employees or their spouse, because I think it's something that it, it's super awkward, but then super important. How many interviews have you had where you are so on board with them? And at the end, just like a, cu a customer to a prospect or a prospect, sorry, to a sales rep, they don't ask for the close. You don't put them in that situation. And then the can't, or sorry, you do put them in that situation. The candidate's like, ah, okay, you, you don't think I'm a good fit. All right, well, I thought I was. I, 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 res I respect where you're coming from. And then the interview's over, right? So I think that's super important um, to do that. Um, but I do want to talk about um, what makes a good, like, if you're, if you're talking about your company culture, not only on the job boards, but like um, on social media, on your websites, why sell the career to that candidate? What's so important? What, what kind of, I know we talked a little bit about for farmers, the protege program for state farm, the agent aspirant program, the mentorship that comes into play, but Vlad, let's go to you with this one. I know you're very passionate about this. Can you give the audience some sort of feedback that you give to your agents one-on-one -on -one here? Yeah. One of the key components that I like to emphasize is selling the candidate on the dream or the dream of working in the agency. And what I mean by that is too often agents focus on the day-to-day -day of what you're going to do when you work in the agency and they don't discuss what it'll be a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, what that could mean to their, uh, to their life. So what I mean by that is if you're interviewing a candidate who says, yeah, I, I wanna run my own business uh, at some point. I don't know what that business is, but I want to be a business owner. I want to be an entrepreneur. So I feel like this is a stepping stone for that. If that's what they say. Then you can say, look, I'm willing to help you open up your own agency. If after a year or two, you feel like that's what you want to do. And you walk them through that process of how you could help them uh, achieve that goal of being a business owner. If someone says, look, I don't really want to run my own business, but I'd like to uh, advance within an organization, which is most people, then don't tell them that this is your job and this is what you're going to do for forever. I don't think anybody says this is what you're going to do forever, but they don't tell them what they can do six months from now, a year from now, if they demonstrate the qualities of a leader. So you can say that, look, if you, if you produce well and you uh, do a good job for our organization, there will be room for growth. Uh, we will need sales managers in our organization. We'll need customer service managers and the best person will get that job. So in our agency, it's not just the sales team or the service team. That's where we're at right now. We have one salesperson, one service producer, but five years from now, the landscape is going to look very different. Our goal is to have 10 people working here five years from now. You literally need to tell them that because it's not obvious to them. As far as they're concerned, 
you're just hiring one additional person. So they're thinking, is it really going to be me plus these two for the next however many years? But if you tell them that, hey, the next few years, I want to have 10 people working here and I'm going to need a sales manager, service manager. Now they're thinking beyond just the next few months. Does that make sense? So that's what I mean by selling them on the, the dream of working in the agency, that it, not just fixating on the first uh, year or two of that being in the agency, but what happens afterwards. Yeah, so good to tell them about the future and you know, really paint the picture. What does it look like? And you know, I like I always like to say, like, paint it in color, mm -hmm. you know, not just black and white, like, yeah, you know, we're gonna have more people than we have now, and we're gonna be doing more than we're doing now. I mean, give them it's some detail. Different. Yeah, different. paint that picture in color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, now you get to the point, and then we're gonna go to to the fifth uh, strategy here. You know, they did the candidate went through the whole process, right? And they came back with the results you're looking for on the assessment. Uh, the phone screen interview went great. Um, you even gave them some of those obstacles that Kevin was talking about, right? And they handled it, you know, uh, to a T. So now we would say it's up to the agent, right? It's up to the agency to train your employees, right? You hired them and you're training them. So what do we do here, right? And that's why I'm actually really glad that Vlad's on this webinar, right? Because he literally has a training course that's designed for this, for new employees and of course, existing employees too. And Vlad, I'd like you to go into that as well and just talk about what you're doing um, and elaborate a little bit more than you did in the introduction so, so that all the audience members knows um, how you can help. Well, I'll, I'll start this one out here. Uh, maybe Vlad can, can sure. wrap it up and just know that it. it's, um, I think this is a really big point because, you know, as we were discussing earlier, it's like the candidate did everything that you asked them to do. They showed up, they applied, they took the assessment, they got licensed, they followed all of your instructions, they did everything. And now they're, they're moldable and we, we hope and coachable, but they're in your hands. And I think it's a big responsibility that maybe some agents don't recognize and realize that, you know, they've got a future. I mean, they might have a family that they need to provide for. And with all that being said, it's up to me now to give it my best. Like I have to jump through the hoops to make sure that I'm allowing them every single opportunity and possibility to succeed. It's my job to train them. It's my job to hold them accountable. It's my job to set goals with them. It's my job to role play with them. And if I don't do my part, then, uh, then I'm responsible for that large bill that we talked about in the beginning of how much it would cost to hire the wrong employee. Because I could hire the right employee, the best employee. But if I think that I'm just going to give them a pen and set them aside, give them a couple videos to watch, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's ongoing. It's never ending. It's staying in contact. It's um, getting to know them personally. So it's almost, this is like uh, the accumulation of everything we've already talked about, all wrapped into one and to let them know that, you know, we do care about their success. And if we care about their success first, then the sex success of our agency will ultimately come in. But, um, it's it, too many times I've heard like, well, I hired the right one. It's sales leader. It's the perfect profile. They interviewed great. They did everything and they're failing. And it's like, but what did you, what were your expectations? What did you do? How are you cultivating and how are you being a leader to this, this yeah. employee? And so ultimately it's up to us as the agency owner to make sure that they're given every opportunity to succeed. Yeah. I I, I, it's, it's funny. I look at managing team members kind of like parenting and raising kids because when you raise kids, I'm a father of two kids, a two and a one-year-old. You can either just let him grow up in the family and hopefully adopt some of the same values and principles and learn things as they go, or you can teach them from an early age how to respect 
the elders, how to open up the door for the person in front of you, uh, proper table manners, those things you can teach. And if you teach them at the right age, then those things will stick with them forever, right? You have to teach those things. They don't just come naturally to, to the kids. With team members, it's the same things. Being a good salesperson doesn't come naturally for most people. They might have been great at sales in their previous job, but you have to teach them how to sell insurance. That's why I'm so passionate about what I do, because I believe agents who do a, a really good job of training their staff on, on, on how to uh, talk about insurance. They, they, they know all the ins and outs of all the little nuances when it comes to insurance. They know all the nuances when it comes to their quoting systems and everything that has to do with what the company provides. But when it comes to the sales conversation, that's where agents typically don't have a process. And that's the part that keeps them away from being super successful. Because think about it. You brought on this great producer. You taught him the, the, the terminology that has to do with insurance. You taught him the systems. But then the thing that makes them actually successful, you don't teach them how to do. And this is where agents drop the ball. So for agents who want to see a great sales process in action, we'll include a link right below this video. Uh, it's insurancetrainingwebinar.com. Very simple to remember insurance training webinar.com you can opt in for a webinar where you can see a sales script in action that agents use to write over 100 items a month just yesterday i interviewed a uh, girl from a gal from all states she's an lsp she wrote 184 items last month in january because she followed this sales script uh, she was already a good producer but she fluctuated between 50 and 100 items on an ongoing basis. There wasn't consistency, but once she learned the script and started using it in every conversation, just kicked butt the following month, wrote 184 items. So um, not saying this will happen for everyone, but when you teach your people how to do their job better, it's surprising how much better they end up producing. So that's my two cents on that topic. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, I know some agents, if they heard that, they'd be like, where do I sign up, right? <laughs> Even half of those policies in a given month. I mean, for some agents, right? Well, so I think that's super important. What's that? That was just one LSP that went from 50 to 100 to 180. Crazy. Crazy, um, for sure. And no, and, and that's awesome. And, and then Vlad, I know we gave a ton of material today, um, a ton, which is awesome. But like if agents want to have this material as like a PowerPoint slide? Or can we include that in today's yeah. webinar or will they reach out to us and we send it to them? How do you want that to work? Yeah, we'll include a link right below this video where people put in their email address and we'll email them a one pager with a summary of everything we discussed about, as well as a link to Ideal Traits, uh, the most powerful yeah. recruiting platform for insurance agents and really outside of insurance agencies. Um, I recommended it to a CPA friend just a week ago. Hopefully she signed up with you guys. But Did you? Looking, yeah. If you're looking for a salesperson or a CSR and you're not using ideal traits, then you're not using the most powerful tool that's available to you. Um, you guys aren't paying me to say this. You're not telling me to say this. I am yeah. a believer. You know this, that I used a competitor before you guys. And I was really happy with that company. But uh, just because I didn't know enough about ideal traits, I didn't try it. I wasn't... 100% bought in. But in the first month of using Ideal Traits, I brought on two salespeople. I had over 100 people apply and I went through the, the, through the process, had everybody do the assessments and it prevented me from having a few really bad hires. There's one guy, and I'll end here real quick, that I really liked. Perfect resume. I mean, I have not seen a resume like this in a really long time. <laughs> Crushed it in the phone interview. When we did our Zoom call, and I gave him the assessment results. I said, he came back as a nurturer, uh, Jeff. I said, read okay. the summary and tell me if you agree with that. And one of the things that it says in the nurturer summary is it says that these people interview really well, but they get bored doing the same task over and over again. So be careful when it comes to hiring them for a sales position. And I asked him what he agrees with and what he disagrees with. And I brought up that particular point. And he said, you know what? That's true. I like sales. I'm good at sales, but I do get bored easily if I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I knew for a fact that this won't be a good candidate for me because they might be good for a few months, but unless I'm motivating them to do a good job, they might not be around too, for too long. So that assessment alone prevented me from bringing on a bad uh, team member So or the wrong team member. 
I highly recommend that agents check out Ideal Traits and we'll include a link right below this video. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you guys all for uh, joining us today and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep these coming. We'll keep trying to provide value and, and get out as much content as we can. Awesome. It was uh, good seeing you, Vlad, and, and thanks for joining. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you, guys.